Snoozecast, the podcast designed to help you fall asleep. Find us on snoozecast.com and follow us on Instagram at snoozecast to find behind the scenes content. This episode is brought to you by Crystal Fountain Ballrooms. Tonight, we'll read about calling cards, also known as visiting cards, from the book Etiquette in Society, in Business, in Politics, and at Home, written by Emily Post and published in 1922. If you enjoy this episode, be sure to listen to our original Post episode from this book called Introductions that aired on August 30th, 2021. A visiting card is a small card used for social purposes. Before the 18th century, visitors making social calls left handwritten notes at the home of friends who were not at home. By the 19th century, men and women needed personalized printed calling or visiting cards to maintain their social status or to move up in society. Visiting cards became an indispensable tool of etiquette with sophisticated rules governing their use. Let's get cozy. Close your eyes. Relax your body into the softness of your bed. Now, take a few deep breaths. Although the principal use of a visiting card at least the one for which it was originally invented, to be left as an evidence of one person's presence at the house of another, is going gradually out of ardent favor in fashionable circles. Its usefulness seems to keep a nicely adjusted balance. In New York, for instance, the visiting card has entirely taken the place of the written note of invitation to informal parties of every description. Messages of condolence or congratulation are written on it. It is used as an endorsement in the giving of an order. It is even tacked on the outside of express boxes. The only employment of it which is not as flourishing as formerly is its being left in quantities and with frequency at the doors of acquaintances. This will be explained further on. The Visit of Empty Form Not so many years ago, a lady or gentleman, young girl or youth, who failed to pay her or his party call after having been invited to Mrs. Social Leader's ball, was left out of her list when she gave her next one. For the old-fashioned hostess kept her visiting list with the precision of a bookkeeper in a bank. Everyone's credit was entered or canceled according to the presence of her or his cards in the card receiver. Young people who liked to be asked to her house were apt to leave an extra one at the door on occasion so that theirs should not be among the missing when the new list for the season was made up, especially as the more important old ladies were very quick to strike a name off, but seldom, if ever, known to put one back. But about 20 years ago, the era of informality set in and has been gaining ground ever since. In certain cities, old-fashioned hostesses, it is said, exclude delinquents. But New York is too exotic and intractable, 
and the too exacting hostess is likely to find her tapestried rooms rather empty, while the younger world of fashion flocks to the crystal-fountained ballroom of the new spendeasy westerns. And then, too, life holds so many other diversions and interests for the very type of youth which of necessity is the vital essence of all social gaiety. Society can have distinction and dignity without youth, but not gaiety. The country with its outdoor sports, its freedom from exacting conventions, has gradually deflected the interest of the younger fashionables, until at present they care very little whether Mrs. Toplofty and Mrs. Social Leader ask them to their balls or not. They are glad enough to go, of course, but they don't care enough for invitations to pay dull visits and to live up to the conventions of manners that old-fashioned hostesses demand. And as these rebels are invariably the most attractive and the most eligible youths, it has become almost an issue. A hostess must in many cases either invite none but older people and the few young girls and men whose mothers have left cards for them, or ignore convention and invite the rebels. In trying to find out where the present indifference started, many ascribe it to Bobo Gilding, to whom entering a great drawing room was more suggestive of the daily afternoon tea ordeal of his early nursery days than a voluntary act of pleasure. He was long ago one of the first to rebel against old Mrs. Toplofty's exactions of party calls, by saying he did not care in the least whether his great-aunt Jane Toplofty invited him to her stodgy old ball or not. And then Lucy Wellborn, the present Mrs. Bobo Gilding, did not care much to go either if none of her particular men friends were to be there. Little she cared to dance the cotillion with old Colonel Bluffington or to go to supper with that odious Hector Newman. And so, beginning first with a few gilded youths, then including young society, the habit has spread until the obligatory paying of visits by young girls and men has almost joined the once universal day at home as belonging to a past age. Do not understand by this that visits are never paid on other occasions. Visits to strangers, visits of condolence, and of other courtesies are still paid quite as punctiliously as ever. But within the walls of society itself, the visit of formality is decreasing. One might almost say that in certain cities, society has become a family affair. Its walls are as high as ever, higher perhaps to outsiders, but among its own members, such customs as keeping visiting lists and having days at home or even knowing who owes a visit to whom, is not only unobserved, but is unheard of. But because punctilious card-leaving, visiting, and days at home have gone out of fashion in New York, is no reason why these really important observances should not be, or are not, in the height of fashion elsewhere. Nor, on the other hand, must anyone suppose that the younger fashionables in New York pay few visits and never have days at home, that they are a bit less careful 
about the things which they happen to consider essential to good breeding. The best type of young men pay few, if any, party calls, because they work and they exercise, and whatever time is left over, if any, is spent in their club or at the house of a young woman, not tete-a-tete, but invariably playing bridge. The Sunday afternoon visits that the youth of another generation used always to pay are unknown in this, because every man who can spends the weekend in the country. It is scarcely an exaggeration to say that not alone men, but many young married women of highest social position, except to send with flowers or wedding presents, do not use a dozen visiting cards a year. But there are circumstances when even the most indifferent to social obligations must leave cards. When Cards Must Be Left Etiquette absolutely demands that one leave a card within a few days after taking a first meal in a lady's house, or if one has for the first time been invited to lunch or dine with strangers. It is inexcusably rude not to leave a card upon them whether one accepted the invitation or not. One must also unfailingly return a first call, even if one does not care for the acquaintance. Only a real cause can excuse the affront to an innocent stranger that the refusal to return a first call would imply. If one does not care to continue the acquaintance, one need not pay a second visit. Also, a card is always left with a first invitation. Supposing Miss Philadelphia takes a letter of introduction to Mrs. Newport. Mrs. Newport, inviting Miss Philadelphia to her house, would not think of sending her invitation without also leaving her card. Good form demands that a visit be paid before issuing a first invitation. Sometimes a note of explanation is sent asking that the formality be waived, but it is never disregarded, except in the case of an invitation from an older lady to a young girl. Mrs. Worldly, for instance, who has known Jim Smartlington always, might, instead of calling on Mary Smith, to whom his engagement is announced, write her a note, asking her to lunch or dinner. But in inviting Mrs. Greatlake of Chicago, she would leave her card with her invitation at Mrs. Greatlake's hotel. It seems scarcely necessary to add that anyone not entirely heartless must leave a card on or send flowers to an acquaintance who has suffered a recent bereavement. One should also leave cards of inquiry or send flowers to sick people. Invitation in place of returned visit Books on etiquette seem agreed that sending an invitation does not cancel the obligation of paying a visit, which may be technically correct. But fashionable people who are in the habit of lunching or dining with each other two or three times a season pay no attention to visits whatever. Mrs. Norman calls on Mrs. Gilding. Mrs. Gilding invites the Normans to dinner. They go. A short time afterward, Mrs. Norman invites the Gildings, or the Gildings very likely again invite the Normans. 
Some evening, at all events, the Gildings dine with the Normans. Some day, if Mrs. Gilding happens to be leaving cards, she may leave them at the Normans, or she may not. Some people leave cards almost like the hares in a paper chase. Others seldom, if ever do. Except on the occasions mentioned in the paragraph before this, or unless there is an illness, a death, a birth, or a marriage, people in society invite each other to their houses and don't leave cards at all. Nor do they ever consider whose turn it is to invite whom. Correct Names and Titles To be impeccably correct, initials should not be engraved on a visiting card. A gentleman's card should read, Mr. John Hunter Titherington Smith. But since names are sometimes awkwardly long, and it is the American custom to cling to each and every one given in baptism, he asserts his possessions by representing each one with an initial and engraves his cards, Mr. John H. T. Smith or Mr. J. H. Tetherington Smith, as suits his fancy. So, although, according to high authorities, he should drop a name or two and be Mr. Hunter Smith or Mr. Titherington Smith, it is very likely that to the end of time the American man, and necessarily his wife, who must use the same name as he does, will go on cherishing initials. And a widow no less than a married woman should always continue to use her husband's Christian name or his name and another initial engraved on her cards. She is Mrs. John Hunter Titherington Smith or, to compromise, Mrs. J. H. Titherington Smith. But she is never Mrs. Sarah Smith, at least not anywhere in good society. In business and in legal matters, a woman is necessarily addressed by her own name because she uses it in her signature. But no one should ever address an envelope, except from a bank or a lawyer's office, Mrs. Sarah Smith. When a widow's son, who has the name of his father, marries, the widow has senior added to her own name, or if she is the head of the family, she very often omits all names and has her card engraved Mrs. Smith, and the son's wife calls herself Mrs. John Hunter Smith. Smith is not a very good name as an example, since no one could very well claim the distinction of being the Mrs. Smith. It, however, illustrates the point. For the daughter-in-law to continue to use a card with Junior on it when her husband no longer uses Junior on his is a mistake made by many people. A wife always bears the name of her husband. To have a man and his mother use cards engraved respectively Mr. J. H. Smith and Mrs. J. H. Smith and the son's wife a card engraved Mrs. J. H. Smith, Jr., would announce to whomever the three cards were left upon that Mr. and Mrs. Smith and their daughter-in-law had called. The cards of a young girl after she is sixteen have always Miss before her name, which must be her real and never a nickname, Miss Sarah Smith, not Miss Sally Smith. The fact that a man's name has Junior added at the end in no way takes the place of Mr. His card should be engraved, 
Mr. John Hunter Smith, Jr. A woman who has divorced her husband retains the legal as well as the social right to use her husband's full name, in New York State at least. Usually she prefers, if her name was Alice Green, to call herself Mrs. Green Smith, not Mrs. Alice Smith, and on no account Mrs. Alice Green, unless she wishes to give the impression that she was the guilty one in the divorce. Children's Cards That very little children should have visiting cards is not so silly as might at first be thought. To acquire perfect manners and those graces of deportment that Lord Chesterfield so ardently tried to instill into his son, training cannot begin early enough, since it is through lifelong familiarity with the niceties of etiquette that much of the distinction of those to the manner born is acquired. Many mothers think it good training for children to have their own cards, which they are taught not so much to leave upon each other after parties as to send with gifts upon various occasions. At the rehearsal of a wedding, the tiny twin flower girls came carrying their wedding present for the bride between them, to which they had themselves attached their own small visiting cards. One card was bordered and engraved in pink, and the other bordered and engraved in blue. And in going to see a new baby cousin, each brought a small bouquet and sent to their aunt their cards, on which, after seeing the baby, one had printed, He is very little, and the other wrote, It has a red face. This shows that if modern society believes in beginning social training in the nursery, it does not believe in hampering a child's natural expression. Not at home. When a servant at a door says, not at home, this phrase means that the lady of the house is not at home to visitors. This answer neither signifies nor implies, nor is it intended to, that Mrs. Jones is out of the house. Some people say, not receiving, which means actually the same thing. But the not at home is infinitely more polite, since in the former you know she is in the house but won't see you, whereas in the latter you have the pleasant uncertainty that it is quite possible she is out. To be told Mrs. Jones is at home but doesn't want to see you would certainly be unpleasant, and to beg to be excused, except in a case of illness or bereavement, has something very suggestive of a cold shoulder. But not at home means that she is not sitting in the drawing room behind her tea tray, that and nothing else. She may be out, or she may be lying down, or otherwise occupied. Nor do people of the world find the slightest objection if a hostess, happening to recognize the visitor as a particular friend, calls out, Do come in. I am at home to you. Anyone who talks about this phrase as being a white lie either doesn't understand the meaning of the words, or is going very far afield to look for untruth. 
to be consistent, these over-literals should also exact that when a guest inadvertently knocks over a teacup and stains a sofa, the hostess, instead of saying, It is nothing at all. Please don't worry about it. Ought, for the sake of truth, say, See what your clumsiness has done. You have ruined my sofa. And when someone says, How are you? Instead of answering, Very well, thank you. The same truthful tone should perhaps take an hour by the clock and mention every symptom of indisposition that she can accurately subscribe to. While not at home is merely a phrase of politeness, to say, I am out, after a card has been brought to you, is both an untruth and an inexcusable rudeness. Or to have an inquiry answered, I don't know, but I'll see. And then to have the servant, after taking a card, come back with the message, Mrs. Jones is out cannot fail to make the visitor feel rebuffed. Once a card has been admitted, the visitor must be admitted also, no matter how inconvenient receiving her may be. You may send a message that you are dressing, but will be very glad to see her if she can wait ten minutes. The visitor can either wait or say she is pressed for time. But if she does not wait, then she is rather discourteous. Therefore, it is of the utmost importance always to leave directions at the door such as Mrs. Jones is not at home or Miss Jones will be at home at 5 o'clock. Mrs. Jones will be home at 5.30 or Mrs. Jones is at home in the library to intimate friends, but not at home in the drawing room to acquaintances. It is a nuisance to be obligated to remember either to turn an in and out card in the hail or to ring a bell and say, I am going out, and again, I have come in. But whatever plan or arrangement you choose, no one at your front door should be left in doubt and then repulsed. It is not only bad manners, it is bad housekeeping. The Old Fashioned Day at Home it is doubtful if the present generation of New Yorkers knows what a day at home is, but their mothers, at least, remember the time when the fashionable districts were divided into regular sections, wherein on a given day of the week the whole neighborhood was at home. Friday sounds familiar as the day for Washington Square, and was it Monday for Lower Fifth Avenue? At all events, each neighborhood on the day of its own suggested a local fete. Ladies in visiting dresses with trains and bonnets and nose veils and tight gloves holding card cases tripped demurely into this house, out of that, and again into another. And there were always many Victorias slowly exercising up and down, and very smart footmen standing with maroon or tan or fur rugs over their arms in front of Mrs. Wellborn's house, or Mrs. Old Names, or the big house of Mrs. Toplofty at the corner of Fifth Avenue. It must have been enchanting to be a grown person in those days. 
Enchanting also were the sea spring victorias, as was life in general that was taken at a slow carriage pace and not at the motor speed of today. The day at home is still in fashion in Washington, and it is ardently to be hoped that it also flourishes in many cities and towns throughout the country, or that it will be revived, for it is a delightful custom, though more in keeping with Europe than America, which does not care for gentle paces once it has tasted swift. A certain young New York hostess announced that she was going to stay home on Saturday afternoons. But the men went to the country, and the women to the opera, and she gave it up. There are a few old-fashioned ladies living in old-fashioned houses and still staying at home in the old-fashioned way to old-fashioned friends who for decades have dropped in for a cup of tea and a chat.